The VO Meter, measuring your voiceover progress. Whether you're a veteran voice actor, just starting out, or don't even know how to set a level, we're here to help you avoid the pitfalls along your voiceover path to success. The VO Meter is brought to you by Voice Actor Websites, Voice123, Studio Bricks, Global Voice Acting Academy, JMC Demos, and Sennheiser. The VO Meter is produced in part using Source Connect, made by source-elements.com. And now, your hosts, Paul Stefano and Sean Daly. Hi, everybody, and welcome to episode 101 of the VO Meter. Yes, like the Dalmatians, 101 episodes. Oh, yeah, and we're measuring your voiceover progress. <laughs> That's right. We'll make a coat of our episodes. Our guest today is Matt Kolrick, a very versatile voice actor that I've had the pleasure of meeting at various voiceover conferences like VO Atlanta and VO North. And Matt even asked me to do sort of a beginning VO presentation for some of his voice acting students at Timber Creative. So we'll get to Matt's interview in a few minutes, but before that, it's time for our VO Meter reference levels. VoiceOver Extra brings you the VO Meter reference levels. Uh, seriously guys, that's the best you could come up with? Hey, it's your show. All right. So, Sean, what's been happening in your VO world or just otherwise? Uh, lots of stuff. So, GVA front, uh, we're working on a new website we're hoping to release in the new year. I'm working on an animation demo with uh, Christina Malizia. Really? really excited about that. It's a long time coming. Let's see, job-wise, uh, just been doing lots of auditioning um, for my agents and my, my regular clients. Been doing e-learning projects up the wazoo, and I've been working with a few coaching students, so that's been great. Uh, what about you? A couple things. My, my live announcing is still going strong. I'm in the midst of doing volleyball, men's and women's soccer, uh, let's see, field hockey, and... I guess that's it right now, but that's enough. Wow. I'm, I'm doing like four, almost four events a week, every week, and Crazy. sometimes going from one to another in the same day, all within, uh, well, somewhat close radius. The last time was about a 10-mile radius, but I do on Saturday need to go from a local university called Stevenson University down to the University of Maryland College Park, which is about a 45-minute drive. But... Um, there's the, the events are far enough apart. I think I can make both. So busy, busy, busy on the live announce front. Not that I'm complaining. It's lots of fun, and this is when it's when I need to take advantage of it because this is when all the the college sports are happening. So that's been cool. Uh, let's see. Last week I went to an interesting event. Uh, our agent that we share, Lisa Ristow from Impressive Talent, asked me with a couple of other talent to attend the Campaigns and Elections Summit in Washington D.C. So they are a, a publication and an advocacy, advocacy group for political uh, people who produce political ads so this was a conference with all the movers and shakers uh, like video producers graphic designers copywriters people who produce political content for candidates all across the country and I think some even international and it took place in Washington DC and the cool thing that Lisa did was as a sponsor she was able to have her talent be the introduction or do the introductions for all the panels and speakers so cool there was, I think, four of us, um, and it was Carmen Wilson, Bridget Real, Marcellus Shepard, and me, Paul Stefano. We each got to introduce one of the one of the panels or speakers. Bridget and Carmen did the two keynotes, which was a little bit more involved, and then Marcellus and I just kind of introduced panels and got to riff on our own stuff for a while, with the idea being that if they liked the way we sound over the microphone, then, then these people in the room would hire us for political ads through Lisa. So... Thank you to Lisa for sending me to that. It was a lot of fun and something I don't get to do very often. Um, put a, a political conference in general, but conferences at all, you know, the few and far between. There's, I mean, there's more and more, it seems, every every month. There's another one seems to prop up, but I don't go to them all. So it was nice to have one in my backyard. Yeah, that's very cool. And then a couple of uh, new clients I wanted to add that, that I've added to the fold. So recently I've done some e-learning work for both PricewaterhouseCoopers and Amazon. Uh, through a local production agency here in the Maryland region. So that's pretty cool. They can now list those two behemoths on my on my website as people who I've worked for. Well, that's awesome. Congratulations. Thank you. 
And then finally, I'm starting on another audiobook any day now. Uh, I've had a couple of weeks where I had no time at all to do anything, so I have to admit I've kind of been lazy the last day or two. I really should have started it yesterday or today, and I didn't either. <laughs> but it's the, the third in a series for an author I, I found, or found me on ACX, called, and it's the Samuel Branch series. It's a supernatural thriller series that I've done the first two books for. Same main character and some ancillary characters that come and go, and then new ones each time. So I'm excited to get to work on that. Man, they're just gangbusters this month. Well done. <laughs> yeah, it sounds more impressive than it really is. Like I said, I literally sat on my ass and did nothing today. <laughs> <laughs> you got to do it sometimes, man. got to recharge. Yeah, that's but, um, true. Before we move on from the reference levels, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that uh, GVAA actually won an award. Woohoo! So uh, NAVA, the NAVA Foundation, or the National Association of Voice Actors, has awarded GVAA, Global Voice Acting Academy, the VO service provider. After being in business for almost a decade, we're really happy to receive these accolades and just extremely grateful to NAVA for the recognition. So there's going to be a big fancy to-do gay law in December that I'm being pressured to attend, but hopefully all of the GVA uh, reps will be there in attendance and uh, get to enjoy looking fancy with all my friends. That's awesome. Where is that gala? Uh, it's going to be in Los Angeles. I need to find the specifics yet. Well, <laughs> but, we, don't need, we don't need that. I was just wondering you know, what geographic region. Oh, yeah. It's going to be in L.A. That's awesome. I saw that announcement. So congratulations to sponsor of the show, the Global Voice Acting Academy. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll get to our interview with Matt Kolarik in just a few minutes right after some questionable gear purchase. So, Sean, do you have any questionable or not so questionable gear purchases to report? <laughs> Unfortunately not, but if you remember last time, I was kind of talking about challenging myself to reintegrate my tablet into my booth, and I have been continuing with that. So one of the cool things about um, some of the later uh, Mac operating system upgrades, like say Ventura, for example, is that your devices can communicate with each other a lot better. So if you plug in, say, a, your iPad or even a laptop, like a MacBook Air or a MacBook Pro, to your desktop computer, you can use them as additional monitors. So right now I've got my Mac Mini, I've got my booth monitor, so I've got two. And then if I want, I can use my, or hook up my iPad versus Wi-Fi or USB, and then have an additional monitor in the booth or at my desk. And then if I'm feeling really fancy, I can hook up my laptop so I have a fourth monitor. So that was pretty fun to play with. And, and like I said before, I've been experimenting with using the iPad as a predominantly as a script reader. So I can kind of stand up more tall and a little bit more barrel chested when I'm doing those warrior anime reads. But, um, but yeah, I've actually been, it, like, it's kind of been challenging myself to like more fully utilize the gear I already have, dare I say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but I've definitely been tempted by some of the options that are available, like what you've been looking at. So tell us about your questionable gear purchases, Paul. Well, first of all, after that conversation in our last episode, I did what you would probably predict, and I sold my iPad. I knew it! Because <laughs> <laughs> it was just collecting dust. I had no reason to use it. By the way, do you want a, a, a free pencil? I can send you one as a... As a free a... pencil? Well, I already got one. It was like the Logitech stylus, right? <laughs> yeah, I had the Logitech crayon. It's, it's different. It's kind of cool. It, it's bigger mm -hmm. and fatter. It's good for people with old hands or maybe it's carpal got, tunnel. It's got like more of a highlighter kind of shape to it. Yeah. yeah, well, it's shaped like a big fat crayon. Remember the the, the long and flat crayons you used when you were in kindergarten when you couldn't quite grip a, a regular <laughs> crayon? <laughs> yeah, totally. It's like that. It looks exactly like that. Gotcha. I actually I liked it, though. I did have a, a regular Apple pencil for a while, and... I did find it a little hard to grip after not really writing anything for years. So the crayon was great for my for my big fat hands. Nice. I like the second one they made. It's got the flat edge. It's a little bit easier to hold and it's magnetized. Why mm -hmm. Apple went with the original one so you could frickin' unicorn it to the new i that newest iPad was just uh so many questionable decisions. But yeah. anyways, tell us about your questionable decisions, Paul. <laughs> well, just uh, to um, finish, well, speaking of questionable decisions, to finish up on that topic. So now, uh, because I don't have the iPad anymore, I did find a use case that I did enjoy using it for that I forgot about, and it's that audiobook I just talking about. So one of the reasons I've been dilly-dallying on, on starting a new book is I haven't read it yet. I haven't prepped it. And that's the one time where I did make use of the iPad was to prep a book. I would sit on the couch 
or sit on a sit on the deck if it was warm enough and use the uh, the crayon or the apple pencil to highlight voices or highlight parts of the text I wanted to go over so I did forget that I might need it for that so now I'm basically giant phone shopping instead of I'm, I'm currently <laughs> using a, a smaller Samsung but now I'm thinking I might go back to a Samsung note or maybe one of the foldables, like the Pixel Fold or the Surface Duo, that are pretty much a portable iPad. I can do basically the same thing and just have it on my on my purse all the time in my pocket. So that's where I'm currently going with this uh, this newfound cash. <laughs> well, good. And I mean, honestly, that's a road that a lot of people do go right. And and I've I thought about selling this before too, but it, like now I'm using it for, uh, like I said, I'm using it for scripts. I'm using it for video or as a second camera or a second monitor. Mm -hmm. So it's found my niche in in my studio. But most people are f like, let's be honest, it's a luxury item. So oh, if you have yeah. a phone and you have a computer, you don't necessarily need the tablet, right? <laughs> so and then you can't uh, even really use it either. Like my part of my, I wouldn't say hatred, but because I used to use a Mac computer, but part of my my problem with with Apple is their planned obsolescence, like almost immediately. So my daughter, as we talked about, just went to college, and as part of her her course, her coursework, they make them take this intro to iPad class to make sure they know how to use it for for media. So because she's at a, a an acting school, they want them to use it for like script reading and maybe some some editing of, of like self tapes and stuff. Yeah, self tapes and the editing of projects if they're using um, some of the some of the Apple tools, like maybe even iMovie, in their dorms. So she needed an iPad, and I was like, oh, you can just use mine. And it said that it had to be the newest version, which is what, uh, iPad 12, 13? I don't know. No, it's the 10. Okay, uh, 10. And that's the one that I was just bemoaning because it's got, like, you, you they made the, uh, the Magic Keyboard. They made it, they split it into two. So while it's more versatile, it's also more fragile. Again, they went back to the earlier pencil design when you need a dongle to charge it and pair it. Mm. It, it was just like... I don't know. I don't know what Apple was thinking. So anyway, mine was an eight, I think, and that was two two versions too old. Even though it's only like two years old, to be able to give to my daughter to use at college. So that was another point of frustration. Where I was like, oh, I can't even reuse this thing, and I have two more sitting around. They're they're much older. I have a, an, an original iPad two with the old thirty pin connector and an iPad Mini that was my daughter's, just sitting here with absolutely no use for them because Apple has made them obsolete. So, I know, it's ridiculous. It's I mean, me. they're still great machines. <laughs> yeah, they could still do a lot. All right, so anyway, back to the happier topics. So in a not-so-questionable gear purchase uh, mode, I have another manufacturer-sent product to review, and it's the SE Dynacaster mic, and I'm using it right now. Surprise, surprise. So if you're listening to this episode, when we get to the Matt interview, I was not using it, so you can listen to the difference. So this is the Dynacaster DCM8. It's a dynamic cardioid microphone. It's very similar in vein to the Shure SM7B, and I saw they actually just released a newer version that looks even more like this because it's a little bit tinier. It looks a lot like the Pod mic, a little bit like the Vocaster mic from um, Focusrite. It seems like everybody is making this style of mic now because podcasters and streamers are using it. So SE has jumped into the fray. And let's give, go over some highlights from the website. It uh, has a switchable preamp. So like some of the newer models that are out there, it has a preamp built into it. I do not have it on now. Right now it's completely flat, and I have my, my interface just pinned at uh, 6 o'clock all the way up on, as far as it can go on the dial, which is what I had to do when I have used an SM7B before or an RU20. It also has two recessed EQ switches and six advanced sonic equalization configurations. These are switches on the back of the microphone, again, similar to the SM7B, and one of my little complaints about it is those switches because they're just as tiny and hard to access as the SM7B. Oh, the only way like I can figure out to do it right tool? now is with the toothpick attachment from my Swiss Army knife. <laughs> oh, no. So it's sitting here in my hand. Uh, again, it's all flat, though, right now. Uh, it has obstruction f f uh, yeah, obstruction-free three-layer pop filtration system and patented shock mount. So there's a filter, a pop filter built into the, the actual um, mic itself in front of the capsule, and it has a yoke that can have it attached to a mic stand. Again, reminiscent of the SM7B. There's a, an integrated XLR plug on the yoke, and that attaches to the mic stand thread. And it has a innovative front address cardioid aluminum voice coil based on V-series technology 
an all metal design and gold plated XLR connector. So those are the highlights from, from the website. Some of the, um, some of the actual specs, let's see, it's got a frequency, frequency range of 20 Hertz to, uh, 19 kilohertz sensitivity of, uh, 2.0 over 60 MBPA. Uh, it's, it can be powered by phantom power. In fact, it needs it for that built in, um, uh, what preamp. It? yeah, the preamp, I forgot it has, it has a name. It's got a marketing name. Let me go back, uh, to the top of the page. Dynamite preamp. There we go. Dynamite. Di- Dynamite. Dynamite. For those of you who are old enough to remember that TV show. <laughs> so, God, I just did well, myself so badly. Family guy for that. My name is Florida. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, uh. Let's talk about how it sounds. So flat, I, I listened to it, and I do like it. Uh, however, you do need to really pop that gain up there if you if you want to get it to to get into any sort of usable level. I'm going to switch some of the switches, and we can see how it sounds with some of those. So excuse the the crunching. Now we're going to go to the roll off. So that should be with the that should be with the high pass filter on. Let me see if it makes any difference. La la la! Oh, actually, it might be louder now. No, there we go. I just just shouldn't be yelling into it. <laughs> test, test. Let's see. It does sound a little bit clearer, I think. <laughs> yeah. So I switched it to. Oh, it's a low frequency and high. Fre- okay. So what I did was I put on the low frequency and a high frequency. Okay. So let me pick up to live recording. So it looks like what I've just done is put on both the low frequency trim. And the high frequency trim. Uh, so well, that explains why it sounds clear but hollow. So. It does sound hollow. Okay. So let's go back <laughs> yeah, to. Yeah, it's, it's definitely lost some some resonance for sure. All right. So let's turn off the high frequency. Put that back to neutral. Oh, he switches. It's killing me. All right. So that should just be just a low frequency filter. Does it have any more bass to it, or is it not as a uh, as hollow, or does it sound the same? So, uh, so you you brought the low frequency. So I, I took off the high frequency, and now only the low frequency, I think, is on. Any difference? Okay. Yeah, it sounds um, doesn't sound as empty. Like, okay. Uh, and then both, yeah. both the flat and with the um, the high pass filter on, like I think it sounds a little. Uh, or, I mean, it sounds very natural. Yeah, that's that's kind of my t- initial takeaway too. So now I'm going to turn off or p- turn on the dynamite preamp. And I'll have, to go, I'll have to leave the booth to put on the, the fan of power. So hang on a second. Stand by. And we should get nothing here now, right? Hello, hello? No. Hold on. Back. Hello, check, 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 check. Oh, whoa. That's hot. And That's really hot. Yeah, it's, it's very hot. Hang on. <laughs> Let me check my levels here. And one, two, three. Testing. One, two, three. Okay, that's pretty hot. Can you hear me? Yeah. It's too yeah, hot, no, isn't it, it? it? That's cool. Um, Is that too hot? Very present. A uh, little. Yeah, little let, me, let me turn it down. Stand by. Can you hear me now? Good. Yeah. <laughs> you know that guy's name was Paul? Like the actor from those Verizon commercials? Is that, his real name is Paul. Oh, I always, really? I always thought that was funny, yeah. I didn't know that. All right, so now I've... It's still pretty hot, but yeah, I've turned it down a little bit. I'm going to push the mic stand back to where I had it before. I've had it... I have it about six inches away from my face, which is where I put most of my mics in this booth. So now the gain is at about uh, 10 o'clock on the dial. So where I was before I had it at six like all the way around basically 180 degrees for my interface now with the preamp engaged the dynamite preamp we're at about 10 o'clock so much less gain required to get this this sort of same signal and i also feel like there's less self noise i mean it could be it could be that the um the the low the the roll off works better with the dynamite preamp engaged i don't really know but i definitely see less noise in it are you hearing less background noise yeah, I'm I'm kind of surprised it's a dynamic to be honest. <laughs> yeah, with this on, it sounds really rich. It sounds full, uh, and I do like the sound a lot. Now, I I noticed that this the same feature was available a couple of years ago in the Aston um, Stealth, and I think they might have been the ones that pioneered having that built-in preamp in the in the microphone. It was the same deal where you had to turn on phantom power to get it to work but what i like about this is that it's a quarter of the size that aston stealth was like a pringles can on a, on a stand <laughs> it was pretty tall yeah it was huge uh, but i mean that came out what 
three, four years ago. Yeah. So, I mean, maybe it just took a while for the technology to, to improve enough to shrink it down. I do believe they have a newer version, too. It's like the Aston Stealth 2 or the 2022 or something. I forget exactly the name. But, yeah, they managed to shrink it down. But because this thing is so compact, I do really like the way it, the way it, uh, the way it fits on the stand. Now, my one concern with it, and to me it's kind of a fatal flaw, is that the way this yoke is designed, it doesn't hang freely like the SM7B where it sort of swings back and forth. It's, it only goes one way, and in order to hang the mic upside down, you're limited in the, the range of motion by about uh, 25 degrees downward, and I would need more to get it to be able to reach my face, basically, because the thumb screw that tightens the, the swivel on it it gets in the way of my mic stand. Now, it might just be this particular mic stand, although I did notice in the documentation it says it should work with any mic stand. It literally says that on the documentation. But the two thumb screws are on the same side. My boom arm, which is an inno gear that I use hanging from the ceiling, is on the right side upside down. And then when I hang the, the uh, Dynacaster upside down, they bang into each other, and I cannot get a mic cord in there, no matter how hard I try, because the mic thread is right behind the, the thumb screw. So I told Essie this, and... They haven't responded yet, but it's basically unusable for me in my space. Right now I have it on a, a just a regular floor mount, I'm a floor uh, mic stand from um, Guitar Center. And I don't usually have that in here because I need the extra space in my 4x4 booth. So I will not be using this long term, even though I do really like the sound. So, uh, yeah, again, that's a fatal flaw for some people if they have an upside down boom arm in, the, in their booth or maybe even a wall mounted one. But otherwise, I like the way it sounds. The features are cool. And I thank SE for sending it to me because it really is a, a dynamite product. <laughs> dynamite. Oh, God. Just got to get it out now. <laughs> so I think that wraps up this month's Questionable Gear Purchases. We'll be right back with our interview with Matt Culrick after these messages. How many times does this happen to you? You're listening to the radio when this commercial comes on. Not unlike this one. And this guy starts talking. Not unlike myself. Or maybe it's a woman that starts talking. Not unlike myself. And you think to yourself, geez, I could do that. Well, mister, well, missy, you just got one step closer to realizing your dream as a voiceover artist. Because now there's Global Voice Acting Academy. All the tools and straight-from-the-hip, honest information you need to get on a fast track to doing this commercial yourself. Well, not this one exactly. Classes, private coaching, webinars, home studio setup, marketing and branding help, members-only benefits like workouts, rate and negotiation advice, practice scripts, and more. All without the kind of hype you're listening to right now. Go ahead, take our jobs from us. We dare you. Speak for yourself, buddy. I like what I do. And you will, too, when you're learning your craft at Global Voice Acting Academy. Find us at globalvoiceacademy.com. Because you like to have fun. Studio Bricks designs and creates the highest performing portable sound isolation booths. Their professionally perfected acoustics enhances your performance and takes your recording to their maximum quality from your home studio. Forget about managing noise conflicts with your neighbors and family. Pursue your passion for voiceover on your own time and on your own terms. In these modern times, every business needs a website. When you need a website for your voice acting business, there's only one place to go. Like the name says, voiceactorwebsites.com. Their experience in this niche webmaster market gives them the ability to quickly and easily get you from concept to live online in a much shorter time. When you contact voiceactorwebsites.com, their team of experts and designers really get to know you and what your needs are. They work with you to highlight what you do. Then they create an easily navigable website for your potential clients to get the big picture of who you are and how your voice is the one for them. Plus, voiceactorwebsites.com has other great resources like their practice script library and other resources to help your voiceover career flourish. Don't try it yourself. Go with the pros. VoiceActorWebsites.com, where your VO website shouldn't be a pain in the you-know-what. Hi, everybody, and thank you for joining us for the interview portion of this episode. Our guest today is Matt Calric. Matt's voiceover career spans over 20 countries, utilizing multiple accents and a variety of voice types and age ranges. His clients include an impressive collection of the world's top brands and multinational companies. Matt records for commercials, promo, trailers, broadcast narration, video games, and animation. Matt's journey into the world of voice acting followed a formal education in classical music, 
a background that imbues his performances with a unique musicality and precision. Outside the realm of voiceover, he also plays on the stage, performing in multiple fringe festivals, plays, and improv theater within his vibrant artistic community. So, put your hands and voices together in welcoming our guest, Matt Calrick. How you doing, Matt? Hey, I'm good. How are you guys? Good. It's good to see you. It's been a long time. It has indeed. Yeah, it must be like half a decade or something. I was going to, it's Wait, four years. Add... It was uh, VO North in 2019. Yeah. Once you add COVID in, the, the last times that we've seen people is, is kind of like less impressive because you got to add the, yeah, yeah, you gotta the, add the three two. year factor. <laughs> yeah, the two. Yeah. yeah, and Matt, we've yeah. actually never met. So pleasure. No, to meet no. You, it's, at least it's over, great the, to over the internet, at least. Yeah, yeah. But I have to say I'm a big fan. I, I was introduced to you early as a member of the VoiceOver Cafe, which sort of inspired this podcast. In fact, so much I tried to buy the domain from Terry when we first started. <laughs> and uh, he I think he would have done it, but he just kind of got lazy and never got around to it, as Terry is wont to do. So anyway, He's I'm a big fan. probably holding out for a, a price war, a bidding war. That's probably what it is. Yeah. <laughs> a bit too low, Paul. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks, man. Yeah, it's, it's great to connect properly. It's great to have you, Matt. So tell us, how did you get started in all this? Well, you so nicely said it in your intro, Sean. Uh, yeah, that, that kind of covers it a little bit. I guess I started in in the arts in Australia and uh, began in music. And I think I was drawn to voiceover somewhat as a fan, as I'm, I'm thinking many of us in this industry were, uh, particularly for animation and video games. And I started chipping away at it in the the very early days of I think VO on the internet in the uh, the early two thousands, and did some classes in my local area in Brisbane in Australia, and uh, yeah, eventually started started booking work, and then I moved over to Canada, and I went full time in in two thousand and twelve, and that's been the story since. Very cool. Well, as you mentioned, you're from Australia, and we want to know what's it like being an expat working in the North American market? What are some of the advantages and maybe some challenges? Yeah, uh, it is a question that applies to what I was doing a bit earlier on when I moved here, I think, because uh, when, I, when I first moved to Canada, my focus was establishing myself as the Aussie in North America or an Aussie in North America, you know, someone who you didn't have to uh, wake up at, at 3 a.m. to do a session with. And my branding was pretty specific for that. It had a honking big kangaroo, just <laughs> very, very, very subtle. And uh, I, I think having that niche allowed me to, um, to cut through, which was an advantage, but then uh, I think a disadvantage is that being a niche, then it was just, it was more limiting. You know, the opportunities were were fewer, though they were more specific. And how has that changed over the years now that you've, well, first of all, have you changed your branding and did that help or or has that sort of hindered things? Yeah, I totally have. Uh, I can't remember exactly w which point it was or even what year. I, th I think it was... Uh, just after I started going full time, I was already doing a bit of work where I would ditch the Aussie accent, uh, mostly in character work. That was that was more of my comfort zone, uh, where I'd do either an American or Canadian or you know some other accent. And as I started to do that more and more, I I realized that the projects that I was able to to get on were more interesting, more fulfilling, and and even more lucrative as well. And so I just started to pull on that thread, thinking, "Oh yeah, well, I'd like to do more work in the in the U.S. accent." And so I did some uh, some pretty pretty hard work in in tightening up the final challenges with with doing a, a consistent accent where where it was very convincing. You know, people just wouldn't know that I was Australian. And um, I started to get some success with that, and then I realized pretty early on that the the aforementioned giant kangaroo was a bit of a, a branding <laughs> conflict. <laughs> I would book some jobs and my agent would be like, you know, because I had done the audition in a in a standard American accent and then uh, my agent was like, should I send them your, your down under voiceovers website? And I was like, yeah, probably not. 
Uh, <laughs> that'll be a little weird. And uh, so then I, I did a, a branding shift where I, I still hold the, the Down Under voiceovers brand. Uh, it's just changed its appearance to not make it look like it's it's me as an individual. It's more of an Australian casting site. And then um, my personal voiceover website is, it really, really d- doesn't make anything of the Australian accent at all. My primary focus is um, the, the North American market and that accent as well. Interesting. And then one more question around the Australian background. Have yeah. you noticed in the last, I guess, three or four years with the the more focused effort on diversity, equity, and inclusion that Australian accents are being called for more in a specific case and having a real Australian do it versus someone putting on an accent? Yeah, I have seen a little bit of an increase just for for brands that wouldn't necessarily pick an Aussie accent. Uh, a, a lot of my work early on was in in the like lo- localization area mm-hmm. where say an ad agency uh, was doing a campaign for for the US and uh, then in doing their global campaign they needed to localize it for the Australian market so that was that was a lot of my work whereas now I'm seeing and it's not just the Australian accent it's it's a lot of global accents where uh, brands in the US and and globally will just be open to something that's that's different and interesting so sometimes Australian will come into to play for that and uh, to your point about it having to be authentic it definitely needs to at least sound like you are from from that country so they'll they'll want to hire locals same for the UK and um, any sort of specialty accent or nationality Awesome. Well, let's talk about genres where there might be a little bit more flexibility in the kind of characters and accents you can portray. Because, I mean, you're a man of many accents. Like, how much of the work that you do is, or actually more importantly, how do you cultivate your accent arsenal? Like, what is your process for acquiring or studying an accent? These days, I've I've tended to keep it narrow for the, the work that I do that is um, what I would call national broadcast or um, I'm not quite sure how to describe it, but I, I think like any of the work that I do with um, an accent that's not like a character, it, it needs to be really, really strong. And it's usually it's usually the work that's going to be broadcast nationally or, um, you know, maybe something in a corporate film. And, and that requires a certain standard and, and accuracy of the accent. And then I think for character work, it's a little more it's a little more free. There's not not that same standard um, in things like animation and uh, and video games. There's a like a a margin of of accuracy and uh, audiobooks. I think even less so. Um, but uh, yeah, for any of the work that I'm doing that is um, more commercial focused, it tends to be within uh it's me doing one of four accents uh, which would be australian um mainly american canadian uh, i'm putting canadian and american in the same ballpark <laughs> just just for uh, for brevity and then um british and what i like to call the transatlantic or the global accent which is really a mishmash of anything at this the point. The one that doesn't exist. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, if if people come to you um, pretending that they know what that accent is specifically, they are deluded. <laughs> so it's interesting. It sounds like anytime you're asked to portray a demographic, it has to be grounded far more in realism as opposed to some of the, like, say, a fantasy RPG, for example. Yes, I, I believe so. It... it it comes down to knowing the final placement of the work, and uh, you know, knowing what the ask is. Like, if it is if it is coming from that uh, character standpoint, I, I think there is that flexibility. But if um, you know it's coming from an ad agency, and um, yeah, they're they're really trying to localize, like make make the uh, the accent seem authentic, then it it really needs to come from a a very very accurate place. Yeah, I would agree. So looking at your website, you've done VO work for almost every genre under the sun, from commercial <laughs> to animation, video games, promo, even audiobooks from major publishers. Was this a conscious choice or did it kind of grow organically? And then two-parter, do you have any advice for VOs trying to break into specific genres? I think it started 
with me just being a ham and wanting to play. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I love the idea of, of playing in those different sandboxes. It's um, That's the most all of us, right? It's like when you first start, you're like a squirrel. Ooh, commercial. Ooh, animation. Ooh, video games. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, it's, yeah, it, it certainly uh, caters to, you know, to that, that desire to, to play. And then I think, depending how you manage it, diversifying um, the the genres you're able to market to is also a smart business move. It just gives you more options as long as you're able to to juggle those and, you know, not be spread too thinly. Uh, so I, I, I think I had a, a pretty narrow field that I was playing in to start. And then as I learned about the different genres and I figured I was able to put my attention to them and, and you know, replicate the the quality of performance I was doing in one and another, um, I I opened myself up to that. And then lately I've made the conscious decision to find my lanes a little more and uh, not be so so widely spread. It's um, you know, it's it's just more my choice of, you know, where my career is at and just trying to gravitate towards what brings me the most joy and and what works in with my my life and um yeah that's that's just been a bit of a change that i've made lately um narrowing the genres that i do work in but uh i don't usually find myself turning down work in a genre if it meets my my own standards you know like my my rates and just the the type of project that i would like to work on it's just that i don't actively go out and and market as much as i used to in in multiple genres it's it's really yeah something that i can count on one hand well, that's sort of the and, approach Shauna I've always talked about in this podcast because when we started it, it was kind. Of, it was really when we were both new in the business, and it was kind of just talking about the things we had booked for the first time. So it was the first time we had a commercial, or the first time we had an audio book, and we always sort of said the best advice we had was to follow the money. If someone's paying you for something, then that's probably something you could focus on if you enjoy it, and if not, then maybe not focus on that aspect of the of the career. Yeah, and I, I think the really cool thing about voiceover, I'm sure there are other parallel careers as well, is that we can almost use certain genres as our day job when we want to break into something that that's really appealing. Say, uh, you know, you make, you do a lot of business in the field of, I don't know, e-learning or audiobooks, so that's your stability. But you're really drawn drawn to a field like, um, say, promo, and you're you're doing coaching, and you're um, trying to find the best partnership with an agent to make that work happen, and you know, uh, just doing all the all the new work that require is required to break into that field. Uh, it's really amazing to have that stability, for want of a better word, of um, you know your your long form narration work to support the endeavor of of getting into that new genre. Absolutely. At GVA, we always recommend people, we're like, look, we know you want to be in a AAA game or top tier animation or promo, but you got to, there are some other genres you can use as stepping stones like commercial or narration or e-learning. Yeah. But meanwhile, every day you're working, you're still doing, you're doing the work, you're still acting in front of a microphone. So it's, uh, we're, yeah, we're very, we're very lucky that way. Well, in addition to being very versatile and very talented, you're also a gearhead, which we love on this podcast. So I'd love to hear uh, what your home studio setup is like, and since you do travel a bit, what your road rig is. Yes, gear, yes. <laughs> <laughs> the endless bunny hole. Excellent. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I've um, really enjoyed uh, learning about the, the tech end of, of our, our industry, and uh, while I've... Uh, you know, tried to keep it to the things that just are needed to do my job. I, um, I'm sure like you guys find myself being distracted by all the, the, the myriad of potential. Uh, but my, my home studio that I have in 2017, 2016, it was like a, almost a year long endeavor. Um, I had a studio built in my home here, um, on Vancouver Island and it's, uh, a lovely, room in a room um you know all the all the surfaces are, are floating and uh i wanted a larger space to work in so it's uh, the booth itself is uh its longest wall is 11 feet and uh then it's like nine feet it's a weird pentagon shape and um then there's a control room on the outside and 
I was using as my my daily mics the 416 and the U87. Wait, wait, isn't it uh, 416 in your nomenclature? Oh, I don't, I don't <laughs> fall in in kowtow with <laughs> with the old motherland. No, I'm 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 well and truly integrated over here. I, it's 416 all the way. <laughs> but but yes, I I do know it's 416 in in Australia. Uh yeah, and I was so I was I use the 416 and the the U87 a lot. And then um, I'm not sure if it's been discussed on the show already, but uh, I cottoned on to the uh, Townsend Sphere mic uh, a while ago, and I started using that one, uh, and I was really happy with what it what it provided as far as um, emulation of those mics, and it's just so easy to use and. Um, and it's it's going into a, a universal audio interface. I did have a um, a channel strip, an analog channel strip, which my mics were going into, but I I ditched that as well for the emulation. So it's a it's a pretty simple setup. Just a, a Townsend Sphere into the Apollo Twin X, and uh, then I I use the the plugins on board to to do any of that minor minor juicing and and uh, switching between the mics. Is that a is that a thorough enough breakdown? No, of the that's studio? satisfactory. I'm drooling okay. right now. Yeah, I'm, I'm tying up the towns in myself. I, and, uh, I actually saw yeah. a really funny meme on your your Facebook page of you recording in tents and cars and actually holding the the towns and sphere in your hand doing a promo. Yes, that was not ideal, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know you work with what you got. I think in, in that case, I was just banging out a quick audition and and uh, it, it sufficed. But uh, that's to to address the the road rig portion that's a, a new change that i made as of i think that trip or i went to um to wovocon in um orlando that orlando one? yes yes thank you i was like where did i go again <laughs> uh so in orlando i i had a tri booth shipped to me um because i wanted to avoid the pesky customs and and shipping uh so it was shipped to the hotel in orlando and i um have a, a great little backpack it's like a camera bag which i was able to safely fit in my my townsend sphere the universal audio solo is what it's called now the yeah the, mm-hmm. the yeah, smaller yeah. Unit, yeah 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 the smaller unit um so that went in and then laptop headphones ipad that that's it and uh that that was my travel rig for that trip and then I did the same thing traveling to Australia and I've just been so so thrilled with how I can try to match my my road space to this booth back home obviously the sound isolation is nothing like I'm I'm getting here Uh, Mm -hmm. you know this is a this is a quiet quiet booth but um to just try and capture that same sound especially if I'm um doing a pickup for work that that I did in in my home studio, and then I'm trying to do it on the road. I, I know that's a problem that we all face, and mm-hmm. and uh, I've been I've been pretty happy with um, with that adjustment. It's it's worth it's worth the little bit of extra travel weight to um, mm-hmm. to bring to bring that gear along with me. No, Paul knows I picked up a tri booth last summer because I was moving into a new house, and so it was a lot of like driving back to the folks's place and the fiance's place and grabbing stuff, and I just needed something that worked in all three, you know, and right. I. It was. I was very, very pleased. You're right. It's not perfect, and if the room is completely empty, you might need some additional treatment. But it's. It was well worth the investment. It's shockingly yeah. good. I did a review for them early on. They sent me one as a review unit to try. I got in trouble with one of our sponsors at the time because uh, I think in the review I said it sounds as good as my whisper room, and they were like, "Did you just say it sounds as good as a whisper room? You can't say that." <laughs> it wasn't whisper room. There was a sponsor. It was another an, another company, and I said, "Did I say that?" Well. You know what? It's true. It sounds great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you just don't get that. Uh, I think George Woodham calls it quiet on demand, um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. which, you know, it, it just depends what, what your work is and, uh, you know, what, uh, how many live sessions are you doing? Um, but it, as far as uh, being a, um, a treatment solution, it's, it's fantastic. And uh, I, I would like something that's a little more, a little more portable, but for, um, you know, for a trip where we're driving in the car um, or I can, you know, I can do that carry on and, uh, or not carry, the tri-booth doesn't carry on, but no, no, like no, I, no. I'm not going to be, 
you know, my my family and I, we often do um, trips with with backpacks and you know do like multi day hiking. And so the tri booth would not have much of a place on on that kind no, of trip. Not quite. But uh, yeah, no, I, I've been I've been really happy with it. It's still awesome. quite a quite a haul. I always feel like uh, Harvey Keitel in uh, in Pulp Fiction, you know, the cleaner. He's got these tons of bags to clean up all the messes. <laughs> it feels like that when you come into a room. <laughs> yeah, not suspicious at all. No. Awesome. So, uh, actually, before we leave that, uh, do you have any funny or unusual stories about the the oddest place you recorded using your mobile rig? Oh man. Um... I mean, just this last trip I did to Australia, um, and it was probably one of those photos that you saw, Sean. I was uh, up on my family's farm in central Queensland, uh, which is like an eight-hour drive north of of Brisbane. And uh, it's this 500-acre farm, a cattle farm, just, you know, out in absolute whoop-whoop. And I'm there in the the sewing room. Uh, It's like this separate separate little building outside the main house and it was uh, it was for a 2 a.m recording session Australian Eastern Standard Time uh, to work with a uh, an ongoing client back in Toronto and um, I mean this this farm that I you know grew up on uh, we had for the longest part there was no mobile reception out there and then here I am <laughs> this this year. Uh, connecting to, uh, I was a pretty, it was a pretty loose 5G signal, but it, I was using a little external 5G modem, and um, yeah, I'm in the tri booth out in the wilderness, and uh, the, the, I'm worrying that the birds are gonna start going off. The morning birds are like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Forget lawnmowers. Yeah, mm. it's just like the coolies screeching out. But uh, yeah, it was just very, very odd to be be doing the work that I was doing at at, um, at that hour in that place. Um, and then, yeah, I've done, I've done, a lot of my weird sessions are in Australia where it's, um, you know, stupidly hot and I'm sitting in my, before the tri booth, I, I often used my parents' four wheel drive, uh, so I affectionately called it Prado Studios for a Toyota, Toyota Prado. Mm-hmm. And I'd be sitting there in my undies and a, and a singlet shirt, uh, just doing a you know a, a very controlled and professional commercial read. And they'd be like, "Okay, cool, just give us a sec, Matt." And then I'd open the door and be like, <laughs> <laughs> "Like Ace Ventura in the rhino suit." Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, hundred percent. So shifting gears a bit, Matt, you've long been a proponent of quality education and training for VO talent, and you're recently offering some training yourself, both through in-person workshops and online offerings. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, for sure. The in-person workshops, um, I don't do any teaching myself as far as uh, you know, voiceover uh, performance. The studio that I own in Victoria, BC, we host, like the studio itself hosts uh, some workshops through On The Mic Training in Canada. They're Canada's uh, leading uh, voiceover education, uh, or they're, they're at least <laughs> they're at least they're up the top. I know uh, Gravy for the Brain have presence in Canada as well, but On The Mic have been doing this in Vancouver for a long time, and uh, they have a, a presence in Toronto, and we just started offering their workshops in Victoria. So my engineer is uh, largely the the one who facilitates all that. Um, but uh, yeah, they've been humming along nicely in, in our Victoria studio. Uh, and then the development that, that we offer through Timber Creative is more on the CRM and, and software side for uh, Encouraging voiceovers to, you know, run their practice like a like a small business and giving them the tools, particularly in the CRM, but also just a general business suite uh, to uh, to run their careers in a in an effective way and uh, be doing all that follow up and just keep a keep a really tight shop. Can you expand on that a bit and then tell folks how they can sign up or find out more about the service? For sure, yeah. So I I started using CRMs back in must have been like 2011, 2012. And uh, I found that a lot of the CRMs I was trying were, were great for keeping track of everyone, but um, I just found it lacking that I couldn't customize it the way that I wanted to. And a lot of CRMs out of the box come pretty geared for people in sales roles. And there's a lot of 
bells and whistles that we as voice talent don't really need. And eventually I had tried out Zoho, Zoho CRM, and though it's quite complicated out of the box, uh, just through all the time that I'd spent with CRMs, I found that I had the skills and the, the techniques to pair that back and also add in a lot of customization that was really particular to to our work. And uh, I mean, people can also do this in other CRMs, but uh, so I would encourage people to set up things like tracking your conflicts if you do a lot of commercials. And it can be just little things that make your life easier, like which microphone you used uh, in a job and any tech specs. You can build in fields in CRMs to do that. And uh, in Zoho CRM, uh, my team and I, we've, we've built a template that basically has all those things done. Lots of fields and functions that are just really, really geared towards voiceovers keeping their career organized. And the Zoho One ecosystem is, or they call it a business suite. It's kind of like uh, Google Suite, uh, Office 365. And it, it contains all those other apps that, that we all need to run our business on a daily basis, bookkeeping, uh, email, the way that I present the Zoho One Suite for voice talent is that it can really be everything you need other than uh, your your door and your recording stuff. That sounds amazing. I hadn't even thought about a, a place to track which mic you use for a job. And as someone who has used probably over 300 mics at this point, that's something that I could really use. <laughs> you would really benefit from that, Paul. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, as I as I started adding the basics in the CRM and I, I was the same, like wanting to track which mic I used and then, you know, our conversation before about different accents, I uh, was actively tracking who was I in this job? Oh, <laughs> so I, I didn't have to like, you know, jump into the booth and be like, who am I today? I could just look at the CRM and, and see, oh yeah, this was um, British accent. Um, so I would track things like that and, and then uh, I just found that my imagination started running wild as far as what what I could get the CRM to do and do things like track which demos I had already sent to um, leads or clients. So then I could run a quick report on everyone that had received my uh, 2020 commercial demo, but I hadn't yet sent them the 2022 commercial demo. Uh, just, just things like that. Like it, it, once I started looking at the guts of the CRM, I was like, oh, yeah, it'd be cool if we could add this feature and you can do automation like every um, – once you complete a job with a client, uh, if you check a little box, it then sets a follow-up task two weeks later to uh, prompt you to go and ask the client for the, the finished product, the finished uh, video. Mm. So you can add that to your portfolio, little things like that. That is so cool. Like not only just like the level of um... – granularity that you can think about these business aspects but just how creative you can be with it because i know a lot of people are like oh i'm just a creative person i don't have that in me but i love that you're just sort of demystifying and just be like no this is a very valuable tool that can help you improve every aspect of your business yeah i love the the creative side of business and you know whenever i talk to uh accountants or, you know, someone who's in uh, what's typically a, a more like administrative or um, process driven career. And they're like, oh, yes, my, my career is not creative like yours. It's just, you know, boring numbers. I'm like, no, that's bullshit. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, there's there's problem solving and there's creative approaches in so many different careers. And uh, I, I think that uh, for a while I looked at the business side of what we do as the the really cut and dry concrete sequential but um when i actually gave myself the space to sit back and think how can i invest time right now to create a solution that really puts the the business side of things somewhat on rails so that frees up even more space for creativity i, I got really really jazzed up about that we work with clients uh it's it's really been through referral and word of mouth okay that uh you know, people have, have come to me and uh, we set people up in the Zoho system where we're an authorized, uh, we're an authorized reseller for Zoho. And then we are able to deploy this template that I've spent 10 years building in, in people's CRMs and just like set it up for them. 
and uh, you know do the assist with the migration from other CRMs. And of course, some people are coming from spreadsheets and pieces of paper on their desk. So we we kind of help with all that. That's that's mostly what my team organizes, and I'm I'm there as the you know more of a consulting capacity. Okay. And if somebody wanted to sign up for the service, where would they find that? Uh, it's timbercreative.ca. Uh, can you spell that, please? Yes. Uh, Timber, T-I-M-B-E-R, creative, C-R-E-A-T-I-V-E dot C-A. I'm glad you did that because I didn't actually know you were saying Timber. With the accent, I thought you were saying Timba, like a Disney character. <laughs> <laughs> like, like Simba's cousin. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's great. <laughs> Fantastic. And yeah, people people sometimes like get the get the joke uh, or the uh, you know the the little gimmick of uh, Timber Tambo, um, like Timber mm. with Ari, um, but they assume that it's that way. But mm. no, I I live in a log home and we live in the Pacific Northwest, so lots of lots of timber <laughs> around. It Makes sense. Went with the went with the uh, the wood version. Gotcha, gotcha. I told you it was too much of a thinker. (laughs) Well, Matt, it's been so great to have you on the podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, guys. Really great to catch up with you and hang out. So before you go, we've heard about Timber, 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 uh, and and how that can help voice actors. Tell us where people can find you if they want to hire you as a voice actor. Oh, for sure. Well, I'm at plainoldmattcolrick.com. That's... M A T T C O W L R I C K dot com, and uh, I'm somewhat on the socials. Um, I'm I'm here and there occasionally. It just goes dark and I disappear. But um, yeah, people can find me on on the the usual suspects. Well, Matt, thanks again for being on the show, and hopefully we will uh, see you soon. That's great. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Sean. Appreciate you guys. Hey, Paul, did you know Voice123, the largest online marketplace for voice actors, just celebrated its 20th year anniversary? Whoa, really? That's amazing. Doesn't really surprise me, though. I've used Voice123 since the beginning of my career. I remember way back in my first year where I booked a job as a hypnotist. I actually got to say, you are getting very sleepy on a radio ad. The whole thing was super easy. They even paid me right away for the audition and said that was all they needed. I've been a member of Voice123 for years as well. I've always enjoyed their upfront policies, ability to contact clients directly, and their commitment to the voiceover industry. Totally. CEO Rolf Veldman has appeared on the show before, and in every interaction I've had with him and the company, i felt a sense of trust, like they really care. Well, if you want a great place to find your VO niche and find yourself as a voice actor, visit voice123.com for more information. Now, VO Meter listeners can also get 15% off premium tier memberships. For more information, visit our website and click on the Click Here to Save 15% banner on our sponsors page. Voice123, speak for yourself. Walgreens, because it's flu season, you live in a place with doorknobs and handrails and, you know, people. We tried booking a vacation rental on one of those other websites. They don't always tell you everything. The stars take it to the red carpet. We are back live from the red carpet. California leads the way for change in America, and so does Kamala Harris. Rated M for Mature. Claire Redfield. And who exactly are you? So, yeah, what hashtag should I use to describe a grown man in a tuxedo wrestling a goat? And prior to 1933, many of them belonged to a variety of political parties that were now outlawed in Germany. This is the story of how Q got curly. Quinn was crazy about curls. Curly fries, curly straws, curly-haired dogs. Hey, Jay Michael here. Thanks for listening to the VO Meter Podcast. It's one of my favorites. If you're looking for a great demo like the ones you just heard, check out jmcdemos.com for more information. All right, and we're back. Thanks so much to Matt for coming on the show. As I mentioned in the interview, he's always been a bit of an idol of mine because of his work on the voiceover cafe. I've been fortunate enough to become really good friends with everybody else on that show, uh, ironically. But Matt, so far, has been giving me the Heisman. <laughs> <laughs> well, you had to go to Canada like I did. Yeah. So. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Well, I don't think it was at all on purpose. We just hadn't had a chance to meet up, whereas I had seen everybody else in person at least once. So thanks again, Matt. It was a pleasure. It was. It was. It was great to catch up. So that wraps up this episode of the VO Meter. Measuring your voiceover progress. We're currently working on our fall lineup of guests and projects, so you'll hear us in the next one. 
Thanks for listening to this episode of the VO Meter. To follow along, visit us at www.vometer.com. We'd also love to hear your comments or suggestions for the show. Or if you have a questionable gear purchase, tell us all about it on our Facebook page or on Twitter at the VO Meter. 